I'm delighted to be able to speak to you today. As Richard has said, I'm trained both in astrophysics to doctoral level and I have a first class degree in theology from my seminary training. So on a positive note, that means I'm highly qualified both to tell you how the heavens go and how to go to heaven. But my mum would probably tell you it really means I'm so heavenly minded that I'm no earthly good. I've not spoken to a big business group before, but this very much brings me back to my Oxford days where I know the freshers' fairs were full of the big finance companies enticing talent to join. And then when I was doing my PhD in Cardiff, I was well aware that more of my colleagues there would end up working as quants in the back room of big finance that would actually end up in telescopes around the world driving observatories. In fact, someone who was doing a postdoc in my office ended up working for the Bank of England. So physics and finance are not too far apart. And my career path could have gone that way, but it didn't, because in 1999, when I was coming to the end of my PhD, I handed in my thesis in July, and I entered a Roman Catholic seminary in September to start training for the priesthood. Now, I hadn't done my viva yet, so at the end of October, I was called back to Cardiff to have my thesis examined. And there was a little panel of examiners. My supervisor sat in but didn't get a vote. And there was an external examiner, and there was an internal examiner from the department, Professor Edmonds. And he knew full well that I'd left the world of science to go to train to be a Catholic priest. So after about an hour of being grilled about the equations and the fine details of my thesis, a wicked grin came over his face. He said, now then, Mr. Lyshen, I've been looking at your references and I found one which is wrong. And his tone of voice made me want to begin to have the floor open up and swallow me up because it sounded like something ominous was coming. He said, turn to the start of chapter three. So I turned to the start of chapter three. And if you've written an academic thesis, you probably know there's a convention that you can start each chapter with a quote from your favorite book that illustrates something in the chapter. And I'd only put one quote from the Bible in the whole thesis. And there it was at the start of chapter three. Look up at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can. I'd written after it Genesis 1 something or other. And he said, I've looked that up in my Bible and it's not what it says. And I realised I'd used a Bible search index on the word star. And the first entry was and God created the stars, Genesis 1. The next entry was God said to Abraham, look up and count the stars in chapter 12 or something. And I'd taken the reference from the line above and pasted it in wrongly. So in my PhD examination, the seminarian had been skewered for getting his only Bible reference wrong, which was at once hugely embarrassing and made no difference to passing my thesis and getting my doctorate. So that was my transition from the world of science to the world of faith. And I want to share something about my story of how I fell in love with science and how I fell in love with God and how I've tried to make sense of those things through my journey. I grew up in West Wales in a town called Llanelli. My mum was a nurse and my dad was a postman. Dad wasn't a professional scientist, but he was really keen on watching science documentaries, things like Horizon and Equinox when they came on the BBC. And I was brought up with that interest in science as well. And when I was old enough to start reading books on my own, I quickly discovered the science section in the town library and fell in love with space science, rockets, planets, asteroids, all of that at the age of seven. And so those of you with longer memories will recognize Sir Patrick Moore, the famous television astronomer. I wrote him a letter when I was seven years old and a letter came back saying, really glad to hear you're interested in astronomy. If you're ever on holiday in the West Sussex area, do look me up. So naturally, my family arranged for our summer holidays to be in West Sussex and Patrick Moore very graciously welcomed me and another young lad who had written to him and we were given the tour of his telescopes and his garden and his xylophone playing. So that was encouragement to me in the world of science. Now, religion wasn't really part of my family experience at home. My parents were nominal Anglicans. They'd both grown up church in Wales. They'd both got confirmed. They would both stopped going to church when they were teenagers. If you ask my dad, he'd say he's an agnostic. God's, you can't prove anything about God, so why bother? Mum was a little bit more sympathetic, 
and would say, there is someone up there, I don't bother him and he doesn't bother me. But we did have a very devout grandfather in the family. My mum's dad sang in the choir at his local Anglican church and he put pressure on my parents that I should be baptised when I was an infant and then that I should go to Sunday school when I was old enough. So they gave me a choice. They said, Gareth, would you like to go to Grandpa's Sunday school? It's up a hill and it's cold and it's drafty. Or you can go around the corner to the local Salvation Army and it's nice and warm and they've got a band. So given this totally unbiased choice, for some strange reason, I chose the Salvation Army. And from the age of about four or five, I went faithfully to Sunday school on a Sunday and I learned Bible stories. I had a good brain, so I could easily remember things, but that's all it was, head knowledge and stories. And I never really asked myself if I believed in Jesus or anything that the Bible was teaching. That changed when I was 11 years old. My granny died and it was the first time I'd lost a relative when I was old enough to ask the deep questions that go with that. And dad said a strange thing. He said, Gareth, say a prayer for your granny. Well, we didn't do praying at home, so I felt a bit out at sea doing that, but I thought I'd give it a go. So I went to my room, I closed the door. I said, Lord, are you there? Lord, if you are there, I hope you're looking after my granny. And Lord, if you're real, please show me, because that could be kind of important. And in a way which is very hard to put into words, I believe God did show me. Something connected in my heart, and I realised when I was praying, I was connecting with someone. So I carried on praying, and I prayed for lost things to turn up, and they did when I was that age, with startling regularity. They don't know, so if you lose something, get a beginner Christian to pray for you, and God will answer their prayers to encourage them. Seems to work. But there I was, 11 years old, taking Jesus seriously for the first time in my life. And in September, I started secondary school and the Gideon Society came round as they do to many schools, giving out copies of the New Testament and inviting young people to take a pledge to read the scriptures faithfully every day. And I believe in keeping promises, so I received this Bible and there was a two-year reading plan, so I worked my way through the whole New Testament in the next couple of years. And everything I read in there made sense. I was already quite a well-behaved child, so all the moral behaviour stuff wasn't a shock or a challenge to me. But there was one thing in there that did require change in my life. I read about the Last Supper and Jesus said, this is my body, this is my blood, do this in memory of me. And the Salvation Army don't do communion services or sacraments at all. So I thought if I'm going to do what Jesus asked, I need to go somewhere else that does serve Holy Communion. And I did a bit of reading about the different Christian traditions and how they handled that. And I made a decision to become a Catholic. Now I'm not here today to talk about that part of my story, but when we come to question time in a bit, I'm more than happy to expand on why I made that choice. But for now, suffice it to say that calling to take Holy Communion led me to the Catholic Church with its tradition of celebrating the Eucharist every day. So by 13, I'd read my way through the whole New Testament and started tackling the Old Testament. There was a summer holiday which was really wet and there was a, a full Gideon Bible and not just a New Testament and the holiday chalet. So on a wet week in August, I read everything from Genesis through to Deuteronomy. And it wasn't the first time I'd encountered Genesis, but I was looking at it more deeply. And here I think it's significant that I'd fallen in love with astronomy at the age of seven with Jesus at the age of 11. So I already had a mindset that understood the basics of science. I knew about the Big Bang. I know how the earth was supposed to have formed. I knew the basics of genetic theory and evolution because I wasn't just interested in astronomy. I'd read around a lot of science things. And so when I came to the scripture, the question in my head was always, what is this saying to me in the light of what we know about the world already? God speaks through the book of nature and he speaks through the book of scripture. So what sense do I make of the Bible that doesn't require me to repudiate what seems to be sensible knowledge gained about the natural world around me? 
and it helped that we had very good RE teaching, second year of secondary school, age 12 through 13. We did look a bit at Genesis and the Old Testament, and they encouraged us to ask questions in that way. We know that some parts of the Bible teach history. We know that some parts teach through stories. When Jesus said a man had two sons, or a man was walking on the road from Jericho to Jerusalem, we don't need to get the name of the man or the two sons because that's a classic storytelling device. Jesus has conjured up these people for the sake of teaching a point. We know in our modern use of language there are certain cues and keys that tell us someone's telling a story. If I open with once upon a time, you know it's a fairy story. If I open with according to Reuters, you know it's a news story. And many Bible scholars would say that sonorous opening in Genesis in the beginning meant the same to the ancient Hebrews as once upon a time does for us. And a good fairy story has a moral, so that is a way of reading it. So I'm going to move to some slides now, so let's hope the technology works. And when we come to scripture, there are certain things where we ask, are we reading poetry or are we reading history. And the early Christians weren't fools, they asked some questions that look surprisingly modern to our current mindset. So there was a scholar called Oregon who lived in the third century, died around the year 253. Some of his writings have survived, in particular his debates with a scholar called Celsus. And Celsus was poking fun at the Christians he was saying the Christians and the Jews, they're silly because they think the first chapters of Genesis are all entirely historical and how does that work? But Oregon in turn said, well, Celsus is the silly one because the Christians and the Jewish writers at the age that Genesis was written, they knew that the point of those readings was the symbolic meaning, not the literal one. So this isn't a new debate among Christians. This has been going on since the third century. Oh. Actually, I'll just expand there. Oregon's argument said, well, how in the scripture could there be the first three days of creation before the sun and the moon and the sky were created? What does it mean by saying evening came and morning came the first day? It means something because all scripture is God's truth, but he can't literally mean the 24 hour day night thing with the sun rising and sun setting because there wasn't a sun to do that. And a few chapters later, when Cain has killed Abel, we're told that Cain walked outside the presence of God. But you can't go anywhere where God isn't present, so that can't mean that literally. And Oregon used examples like this and others to say, look, there are some lines in the Bible that their own very nature tells us have an, a true interpretation which can't be literal, or you end up tying yourself in knots that don't make sense. St. Augustine of Hippo, similarly, living a little later, died in the year 430, great scholar, great bishop of the church in North Africa, wrote many treaties, but one was called De Genesi ad Literum Imperfectus Liber, of Genesis and the other uh, books written and the letters that are not finished or not perfectly expressed. And he goes through many things in Genesis and uses the same device that scientists use in their argument. They say, if this is literally true, or if this mathematical proposition is true, what are the consequences? And does it lead us to any contradictions, any problems? If it does, we have to take a step back and say the starting point can't be what we thought it was. There are too many examples in Augustine to go through, but he does a very good philosopher's job of showing all the pitfalls you fall into if you try and take every phrase of Genesis in its most literal possible sense. So he argues if it's God's truth, the truth must be something which is meaningful, but not that literal. Fast forward a millennium, because for the next millennium, Christians were quite relaxed about reading Genesis in a true, but not slavishly literal way. Then you get Martin Luther, in the late 1400s, early 1500s, who raises questions about which book should be in the Bible. There were seven books that the Catholic Church had very happily had as part of the Old Testament that weren't originally written in Hebrew, but were books of Greek scholarship from that later period when the Jewish people had gone into exile in an empire that spoke Greek. 
And Luther said, but no, 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 the original word of God, that's only the books that were written in Hebrew. Well, when we're arguing about the Bible, we need to know how do we agree which books exactly make the Bible. And that was opened up for debate by Luther. Then one of the other leading reformers, Arminius, in 1560, dying 1609, taught very strongly about what he called the clarity of Scripture. God wants to speak to us, said Arminius. So clearly, God's going to speak in a language that any reasonable, intelligent human being can understand. God's not hiding himself. God's going to speak in Scripture in a way that doesn't need interpretation. And this was a challenge to the culture of the Catholic Church, which had kept priests as the official interpreters of Scripture. And the Bible was very much written in Latin with scholarly footnotes in Latin. And then as Latin was coming out of use and people spoke local languages across Europe, it was the job of the priests to explain to the people what the Bible meant in case they got it wrong. Is that a little bit arrogant and over-controlling? Well, probably it is, and 500 years later the Catholic Church admitted that, but at the time it became part of defining what it was to be Catholic or Protestant. And into this febrile atmosphere of the 1600s, when the Protestant Reformation had broken away from the Catholic Church, and there were lots of debates about how literally the Bible should be taken, along comes Mr Galileo. Galileo Galilei, living in Italy, not the inventor of the telescope, that technology had come along as glass making and lens grinding had developed, but the first to point a telescope at the sky and record what he saw. In 1610, he published a book called The Starry Messenger. He'd looked at the moon and he'd found that the moon had craters and ridges and all sorts of structures on it. It wasn't a perfect plain orb in the sky. It was defective. And Jupiter had at least four of its own moons going around it. Galileo could see them as points of light whose position changed week by week. That meant there was something in our cosmic backyard which definitely didn't go around the Earth. Jupiter's moons went around Jupiter. Earth couldn't be the centre around which all things revolved. How did the Church authorities respond. Well, in 1611, the Pope of the time, Paul V, was very sympathetic. And the Jesuit religious order, they had astronomers as well. They were very scholarly. They started using telescopes to do what Galileo was doing. And the Jesuit astronomers said, yes, Galileo is correct. There are structures and blemishes on the moon. Jupiter does have moons going round it. That's true. Then in 1613, Galileo published his observations of spots on the surface of the sun, which change week by week. He says, look, the heavens are not fixed. Things change in the heavens. And the next year, and this is where he starts getting into hot water, he doesn't just talk about his observations as an astronomer. He starts talking about scripture. Well, those passages, he said, where God says, you have fixed the stars in the heavens and the sun moves on its course. Well, some stars are not fixed because I can see things that move there. And is it the earth that goes around the sun or the sun that goes around the earth? The Bible seems to have the earth fixed and the sun going around it. But there's increasing evidence, not from Galileo, but from Copernicus, who'd been writing earlier, that it works better if you imagine an earth that goes around the sun. And the Vatican launches an official investigation. There's a cardinal called Robert Bellarmine, now regarded as a saint of the Catholic Church, who's quite open-minded about this and say, OK, maybe scripture is going to be more poetic and less literal when it talks about the sun and the stars, if we can establish the facts and prove things. But then a new pope came into office in 1624, Urban VIII, and he warned Galileo, if you think it makes sense that the sun is at the centre and the earth goes round it. You can only teach that as a mathematical model that makes the maths easier, not as the way the universe really works. Well, Galileo wasn't too happy about that. And then he didn't downplay it as much as the church wanted, which is why in 1633 a church tribunal said he was suspected of heresy because he really is teaching that the earth moves and isn't the centre of the world.
In hindsight, as Christians, surely we should take a humble attitude and not expect to be the centre of everything. But the Catholic Church in those days, very cautious about reinterpreting scripture. Galileo died in 1642. In 1741, a pope who decided there was more evidence that Galileo was on the right track, gave an imprimatur, which is Latin for let it be printed, an official Catholic license that said, yes, Galileo's complete works can be printed and read by Catholics. In 1822, a Catholic priest wrote a book on astronomy that said, it's a fact that the sun is at the center and the earth goes around it. And that got a church license to be printed. It wasn't until 1838 that we got firm evidence for the true distance to a star beyond the sun. So the facts are established rather slowly. Eventually, in 1992, a Catholic commission of theologians said, well, I'll read this out, that the theologians of the past failed to grasp the profound non-literal meaning of the scriptures when they described the physical structure of the universe. That led them unduly to transpose a question of factual observation into the realm of faith and to a disciplinary measure from which Galileo had much to suffer. And that shows us the Catholic Church's contemporary stance, which, which is that we trust God's revelation, which is found in the Bible, to teach us about morals, what's right and wrong in God's, sense, in God's eyes, to teach us about faith, the truth about God, but not necessarily to teach us about history or science. When Darwin came up with his Origin of the Species in 1859, the big response came not from the Catholic Church, but from the Anglicans. There was a famous debate in Oxford the following year with Thomas Huxley on Darwin's side versus Anglican Bishop Sam Wilberforce, where insults flew either way. And there isn't a literal record, but according to hearsay, the bishop asked Huxley, is it through your grandfather or your grandmother that you're descended from a monkey? And Huxley replied, I wouldn't be ashamed to have a monkey for my ancestor, but I would be embarrassed to have a man who used his intellect to hide what's plainly the truth. The Catholic Church stayed pretty quiet. It had learned from the Galileo affair and it didn't say much about evolution. It did ask some priests who'd written books advocating it not to publish those books officially, but it never condemned Darwin's viewpoints. In fact, the first official Catholic statement came a whole 90 years later when Pius XII wrote a document called Humani Generis. And in a nutshell, it said all Catholics were bound to believe that all human beings are the biological di direct descendants of one original sinner. When I read about that at seminary, that bothered me. I thought, how do I fit that with what I know about science? Because does that fit with evolution? The Pope was interestingly not hanging it on Genesis because he would have said we're all descended from one original couple if you were going for literal Adam and Eve. The Pope's clearly hanging it on the line in Romans that said, as all men sinned in Adam, so all are redeemed in Christ. The whole idea of original sin needing to be redeemed by Jesus doesn't really make sense if you have to throw out that part of Romans. So the Pope wanted to keep the idea that all human beings are tainted because we're all the descendants of one original sinner. But after I thought about this for a few years, I thought, well, this theological idea, all human beings are the descendants of one original sinner, it's rather like what we say in biology. All creatures that have a particular genetic trait, let's call it X, are the biological descendants of the one original creature in which mutation X first arose. I'll just show you that graphically and then I'm going to finish with this because I know time's almost up. But here's how it works. Let's say there's some creatures here and they're fuzzy and they've got tails. And they breed and two of them have a child and there's some genetic mutation that means a child is born without a tail. And maybe where they're living, it's not really an advantage to have a tail. They're living on the land, they're not climbing trees. You don't need a tail for balance and it takes energy to grow a tail. So if you're not growing a tail, that's less food you need to eat to survive well. So if it's an advantage to not have a tail, well, some that young one grows up without a tail 
Some of the others die off in the population through old age or disasters or being hunted by something. Then the one without a tail breeds and its children don't have tails. And eventually, as time goes on, because it's more successful being without a tail because you don't need much food, eventually the whole population ends up without a tail. An evolutionary step has happened. There they are having their children. And evolution just says if there's a successful first change, then that's what passes through. And so if that's all that Darwin's claiming, then it's quite easy to say if there was a change at some point in the history of human beings, which gave us the capacity to sin, maybe that was a brain that could think in language and reason in a way we'd never done before. If the first human ancestor with the capability of sinning did sin, then every descendant both inherits the brain that can think in terms of morals and that spiritual heritage of being descendants of the original sinner. And so once I worked that out in seminary, I was much relieved that I could believe what the Pope had taught in 1950 with integrity and I didn't have to say there's something in science and there's something in my faith which don't mash up. I could say so as we've seen, it took a whole 90 years for the Catholic Church to make a formal pronouncement at the highest level about Darwin's theory, and that was to defend dissent from an original sinner, which I thought for many years was a headache, but in fact can be read in a way totally consistent with Darwin's theory of evolution. And indeed, in 1996, Pope John Paul II himself issued a declaration which says that some new findings lead us towards the recognition of evolution as more than a hypothesis. In other words, he's saying it's not just a possible theory by which we can understand where the human race has come from. The evidence looks pretty good. And that's as far as the Catholic Church will go, because it's not the job of a Pope to pronounce from his chair of teaching on anything that strictly belongs to history or to science. He can only pronounce on truths of faith and morals. So my personal stance is that when we read the book of nature, God speaks there as fully as God does through the book of scripture. So we can trust the evidence of the earth and the evidence that we see in the universe that suggests there was a big bang about 13.77 billion years ago, that the planet earth formed four and a half billion years ago. I'm using the American billion, so that's just a thousand million. That life evolved in some way, still a very mysterious question of how the first living cell got going. But at some point in the evolution of what we now call human beings, there was the first true human, a creature to whom God breathed a soul for the first time, a spiritual essence, a creature that had the capacity to choose morally between right and wrong, and which on at least one occasion chose wrong and therefore sinned. Scripture does seem to say that the whole of creation was tainted by the fall of man, and if read literally, it suggests that death and sickness came into the world as a consequence of human sin. That's quite difficult to read knowing what we read about nature, whether it took a couple of days of creation or millions of years of evolution to go from animals to man with the capacity of sinning being present, Surely there would have been carnivorous animals before. How could they not eat other animals after that point? So the way I choose to understand those passages about the fall of creation is had the first human being succeeded in living a totally grace-filled life, then and only then God would have given some miraculous gift of living longer than the normal human lifespan and miraculous interventions in the world around us to create this world without death. I don't think it's viable to read an earth where there were no earthquakes, nor disasters, nor animals eating other animals before the first human being sinned. That might be a problem if you want to read parts of the Bible literally. I don't think it's a problem if you say the Bible authors were only using the science as they understood it at their time to say something incidental not something revealed about the state of the world. The universe runs by a set of mathematical rules. If there's only one possible set of consistent rules, then at some fundamental level, those rules are true. 
And if that's the case, they represent something about God whose very nature is truth. On the other hand, if they're one of many possible sets of rules, then maybe God had something to do with lording the dice so that we ended up with a set of rules that allow the likes of us human beings to exist. I do believe God can and does intervene with little nudges and produces miracles at times in answer to prayers. Whether the whole process of evolution needed divine nudges to put it in the right way, or whether God could just sit back and let things take their course, on that I have an open mind. I believe it's totally consistent to take an alternative view that God made the universe through a direct act. But if he did and it came into being in an instant, God made it looking as if it had been around for a lot longer, following the laws of science consistently. So yes, God can create the world 6,000 years ago, make it look like it's been around a lot longer, but that might have a problem if you create it with lots of human beings on it, how can they be the descendants of Adam? And if you create it with only one, then is that consistent with the Maoris in New Zealand and the Aborigines in Australia and the Latin American native tribes and the North American tribes all getting to where they are and the genetic diversity of the human race? Yeah, I think you can go for a long time span and have God creating things looking like physics has been around, but with biology, I think if you go any less far back than the first genetically human creature, it's quite difficult to imagine a joined up act of creation where things looked different. But the Catholic Church doesn't teach that you must believe in evolution or that you must believe that God intervenes as a direct creation, as long as you can acknowledge God in some meaningful way as creator and you don't deny that all human beings are blood descendants of an original sinner, you can be a Catholic in good conscience. So I'd like to give the last word to Pope Benedict XVI, who in his inaugural address as Pope in 2005 said this, We are not some casual and meaningless product of evolution. Each of us is the result of a thought of God. Thank you for listening and God bless you.